Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted, with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, Roy Whitman and Scott Roy. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting Life Unscripted. I'm so grateful to have you here this evening. Um, this is a great show. We get a lot of comments from very lo- a lot of launch businesses as well as all businesses, being excited about the topic of sales, wealth building, investing, and that sort of thing. And you have a new book, Decision Intelligence selling, uh, very important, but you're going to talk about a different aspect of selling that most people don't even think about. And that is attitude. What part does that play in (laughs) selling? But before we go there, I want each of you to share a little bit about your backstory and what brought you to even working together. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. I'm I'm the, I'm the dyed in the wool sales guy. Uh, I started selling books door to door in 1980 or 1977. Okay. With a company called the Southwestern company. And I built a, a career in sales, mostly direct sales for the first 20 some odd years in publishing and insurance, built an insurance company that went national and um, and is now a couple of billion dollar insurance company, and then got into consulting. And uh, during that journey, I met Roy. Uh, and uh, Roy was the guy who, who really lit my fire around the subject of attitude, uh, which is a and in such an important topic for salespeople. Yeah. And uh, so I met him in 1986. So Roy, I'll pass it over to you. Tell you about that, people. You bet. My, my first job was actually in sales as well. I sold door to door for the old Fuller Brush Company wow. uh, in America. Uh, but then I got very interested in the 60s mm-hmm. in um, human potential and uh, was part of the whole human potential movement. Mm-hmm. And how it is that people actually transform the way they think, the way they behave. And that's been my focus for a long, long time. So I brought kind of the transformational angle to our partnership. Mm -hmm. That is so fascinating. And, you know, I don't think it gets a lot tell today. It's quite simple. You hear people say, oh, where am I going to get my leads? There is no leads out there. I've heard people say, I can't find anyone. I'm like, today in this day and time where you can go on the internet and you can become a quite, quite lazy with just, you know, emailing people perhaps and doing the social media when in your day it was get out there, knock, knock, knock a hundred doors to keep going. And you know, the more knocks, uh, eventually you're going to get some people who are going to pay attention to you. Um, right. But through the original door to door selling, what, what do you think has changed about the way you go about it from today's modern way of selling? Has it changed much or is it pretty much the same, whether it's online or in person? Yeah, well, that's a that's a quite a large question, uh, and and we we still have clients who actually do uh, go door to door as a sales consultancy. We have the whole broad range of clients from B to C all the way up to you know very large B to B multinational sort of complex sales types of clients. Um, what's really interesting, uh, Christina, is that is that you know selling even from the simplest thing of just a simple transaction all the way up to incredibly complex sales. Have, it, it's really the same thing. It's just you do it a lot more times when you're up in the in the B2B complex space. Yeah. I think really what you're talking about now is just the prospecting angle. And uh, and certainly it has changed. It's restricted people's out, outward movements and things. I think it really exposes uh, one very important area, and that is the subject of, of referrals and customer relationships. And it, companies that haven't really paid much attention to that, and it's just yeah. it's been turning the wheel and grinding out more sort of cold leads and and sort of doing that sort of routine are really paying the price much more than let's say companies that have good relationships with clients and have been actually mining uh, the uh, you know potential leads and also additional business from those client from uh, from those existing relationships. Um, but certainly, you know, knocking on a door uh, is very similar in, in many ways to how you would do cold leads uh, or cold uh, uh, prospecting in, uh, you know, using different uh, social media platforms and things like that, or even picking up a telephone directory. So you're, you're going to have a certain amount of rejection that is going to happen. Or And I say rejection, meaning refusals, people saying, I don't really want to talk to you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's as much as really changed as much as the media has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if I could, go. I'm sorry. Could I, could I build on that, Christine? Oh, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from a transformational point of view, one of the things we're bringing is that what really must change is the way you regard selling. 
Mm. And the whole, what could be called paradigm of selling, the frame of mind we hold it in. And one of the things that we've learned is that most people, if you scratch them deep enough, and we found this from multinational salespeople doing deals in the millions and tens of millions of dollars, Mm -hmm. down to developing world people selling a water filter to people that don't have clean water in, Mm -hmm. in different parts of the developing world. We found that Everybody seems to think that selling Mm -hmm. is this dark art of talking people into buying stuff. Forcing them. Yeah. Yeah. Forcing them, pitching them, persuading them. And everybody expects sales to be like that. Mm -hmm. The salespeople expect it. The customers expect it. The people, the CEOs of businesses expect their salespeople to go out and pitch and persuade and pressure And instead, there is a way to go about selling, which is instead of thinking that selling is about convincing people to buy, Mm -hmm. that instead, if you start realizing that great selling has always been about and is really about increasing the customer's ability to make the best possible decision for themselves, Mm -hmm. even if that decision is not to buy from you. Mm -hmm. If you can sell like that, you are going to find that you don't do as much cold calling because you've got plenty of referrals and repeat business because you're different and you're actually on the customer's side. So how to do that, how to transform the way you think about selling, how to shift your attitude about it, Mm -hmm. and then how to structure a selling process Mm -hmm. that is honors that way of selling. In, which is improving a customer's what we call DQ, their decision okay. intelligence. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what selling really is. And you can learn how to do that. Um, you're going to have a job for life. <laughs> I love that. Because really, it, it's not about pressuring something, uh, someone to do something they don't want. Really, the whole purpose, if you're there, if you have something that they need, want, or desire, is that you're just helping them come to the decision. Is this something that you need, want, and desire? And I'm here to provide it, uh, aka provide service to you in, in one form or another, whether the service is a product or if I'm giving you information or, um, you know, in any such fashion. But you know what's interesting is that you mentioned attitude. Uh, is attitude a mind thing? Is it like the way you come out there in, mm. in, you know, behind the scenes or is it something the way you're presenting yourself physically? Well, what's changing? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I, if I take my, my, my relationship with Roy back to 1986, you know, I had been uh, uh, building sales organizations for about 10 years by that time. I had about 140 salespeople underneath me and the salespeople and managers by that time. And, um, but I was a line sales guy. I mean, I was out there, I'm 100% commission, knocking on doors, making 30 presentations a day and, and some days selling one, two, zero, eight, whatever it might be. And, you know, it was, it was really, it's was, it was like when I was selling, my attitude was way up. Yeah. And when my, I wasn't selling, I got very negative and, and, and I was, my attitude was way down. Mm-hmm. And so my attitude sort of rose and, and, and dropped, you know, we went up and down based on my results. And so, you know, many, many years ago, I was listening to people like Tony Robbins and mm-hmm. Zig Ziglar and, you know, these, you know, great, great uh, public speakers who would get you really sort of revved up. Yeah. And uh, so I had this understanding that attitude was really important to my performance. I knew it was. Mm-hmm. But it was like I liked my job. My my first angle on it was I liked my job when I was selling, and I hated it when I wasn't. Right? <laughs> and then, I and, in there. <laughs> yeah. And then and then I learned sort of you know it's the second level is wow you know if I start being positive and being you know sort of positive instead of negative I'm probably going to sell more because I'm in a positive frame of mind yeah. as opposed to negative. And then when I met Roy, all of this kind of got thrown out the window in a sense because. You know, it's, it, you know, sort of very blunt instrument, positive attitude, wow. negative attitude. I had it right. It had something to do with my performance. And um, but but what I learned from him was some secrets that I oftentimes say from those dates in 1986. And uh, it was just it was like such a revelation. I look back to those days, uh, three days in a training program. And I came out of that like I had just won the Holy Grail or found the Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. And from that point forward, I always built my sales organizations 
uh, properly with respect to attitude and how you empower people mm -hmm. by teaching them how to manage their attitude very proactively. And that's the, that's the mastery he brought me. Wow. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got one of those too. <laughs> 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 Thank I'm just waiting for him to go off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my husband's tending to him right now. But yeah, th that brings to mind for me, and it's really hard. You had mentioned how hard it is to um, keep the positive attitude. And, and also, you had mentioned that it doesn't have to be that I have to sell, that you're okay, that if you're not the right person, the right product or information, that you yeah. pass it on to what's best for the client. And I recall many years ago, I was going to put on an event and someone called me and said, mm -hmm. I want to work with you. I heard good things. And I was like, well, that's great. I want to sign her up. But what she was going to do was not going to match my brand. And it was the hardest thing ever at that moment for me to tell yeah. her, hey, I know this other person that'd be better for you. Uh. But you know, it did work out later on because, you know, we have a good relationship. Uh, she sent me people. But at yep. that moment, uh, and talk to me about the attitude. How do you go through those moments when, hey, maybe you're a new business owner, you need to make sales so you can pay your bills and the lights. And but, you know, you have those people you, you know, you quite can't quite can't help. But it's hard to just let them go to someone else. I mean, how mm -hmm. do you get through those those moments? <laughs> well, the first way, first thing to do is to learn about what causes attitude. Mm. Because if it's something that's purely caused by external events, like Scott was saying, you sell a lot, you're up. Yeah. You don't sell a lot, you're down. If it's all about what the external event is that causes your attitude, you're really in tough shape. Yeah. <laughs> because there's not a damn thing you can do about it. <laughs> yeah. But what most so most people are now aware of, they weren't aware of this 40 years ago when we started our training program, the one Scott came to. At that point, people really weren't that aware of the negative thoughts they have that run around in their head. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's really changed over the last four decades is that people are pretty aware of the negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. What they're not aware of is that it's their own brain producing those thoughts and that it started producing them around five years of age. Wow. So are those same thoughts, those five-year-old thoughts pulling straight up into your adulthood when you're trying to sell? They, what they're, they keep repeating in your head because what happens at five years of age and neuroscience has, has finally documented this mm -hmm. is there's a part of the brain right up in the frontal cortex that develops mm -hmm. that is self-reflective. And whatever happens to you, the brain looks at it and immediately does three things. First, it draws conclusions, whether it was a good thing that happened or a bad thing. Who's to blame? What did you do wrong? What did they do wrong? The next thing it does is it tells you what you'd better do in response. You'd better get tough. You better get smart. You better just stay quiet and hope it works out, whatever it tells you. And then it threatens you with what will happen in the future if you don't do what it's telling you to do. And that process is part of everybody's normal development. Mm. And it, over time, starts at age five, gradually works forward. Um, you know, up, if you, you have, have you had children or you've been around small children? Well, I've been around them. I've been around them. them. Okay. <laughs> but if you've been around them, you know that young children uh, are pretty much in the present moment. If they're not having a meltdown, they're right here and they're, they'll do anything, they'll try anything, they'll sing, they'll dance, they'll play sports. But starting at about six or seven, they start coming home saying, I can't do math. I can't play music. I, you know, I can't play, I can't do sports. And this is their brain making those conclusions and starting to tell them who they are and what they can do and not do. Wow. And this all happens unconsciously. Mm. And the result is that by the end of our teenage years into our early 20s, mm -hmm. we have a personality. <laughs> that is, we believe certain things about ourselves and we go on a form of autopilot where it's very hard to change the way we think about it. Mm. Um, and so the whole work on transformational, the whole theory of transformational work is how to change that. And it actually 
is changeable. Mm. Well, this is amazing for me. So you're getting started. Maybe someone listening in today has never heard these concepts. Where do they begin to even realize what are some of the negative thoughts they might be thinking? How can they start to change their attitude? Where do they begin? Mm. Well, that, that's that's a really good question. And Get your book, probably. The, the first, yeah, no, seriously, because the first place to start is you've got to become aware of your attitude moment by moment, mm. whether it's up or whether it's down. And in fact, we um, we wrote a little ebook about this called "The One Thing That Changes Everything," and it's, it's on it's on Amazon. You can go and look for it, and um, and it will help people start spotting where they are on what we call the attitude spectrum, mm-hmm. whether they're above the line and kind of responsible for what they're doing and seeing possibilities or whether they're below the line struggling with being compulsive or feeling overwhelmed. And, and, and that's the first step is just become aware of where you are. Actually, um, you know, COVID has been uh, a a really um, big, um, you know, a big shock to so many people. And there's such an opportunity really to learn about how attitude works just because of this, pandemic, you know, and uh, in fact, when we wrote that little pamphlet, uh, it's just really a very simple e-booklet. Um, we were doing it because that was our our way of saying, this is what we can contribute. Uh, we can't do personal protective equipment. We don't know how to make ventilators. We don't know how to you know, <laughs> do any <laughs> make plastic or rubber gloves or whatever. Yeah. But what we do know is about attitude. And so we um, we decided, in fact, I was sitting in this very chair and I think Roy, you were sitting in that very chair along with our senior team, and we decided that we were going to we were going to release um, this very tiny publication that would it, help people see how COVID was triggering all this stuff, all this attitudinal mindset stuff mm. that actually could really be beneficial for people to learn about how the mind works. And so, the one thing changes that changes everything is 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 literally if you can learn how your mind works and then what to do about it, Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, it unlocks so much, so much in, in in terms of performance. I mean, we know this, you know, from, you know, uh, professional athletes and, you know, attitude coaches and, you know, the psychologists, sports psychologists and all this kind of thing. So it's been around for a while, but many of us have never been taught this. Mm -hmm. Many, Many of us, A, don't know about it. B, even if we knew about it, we wouldn't even know where to start. So the one thing that changes everything is a good place to start. There are lots of other places to go as well, but that would be one place to start and begin to see attitude and mindset through the lenses of what it's like to deal with COVID, for example, because all of us have reacted in different ways, but it gives us insights into how our minds actually work and process information. You know, it's fascinating to me because when COVID first hit, Scott and Rory, I at first was really like, this is horrible. Oh my God, it's the worst thing ever. And I'm sitting at home. I was really depressed eating so much cake. Uh, I'm surprised I only gained about 10 pounds. Um, yeah. All my friends are laughing that they gained the 19 uh, COVID-19 pounds. The COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> um, because we're all like comfort eating. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I began to really like the fact that I wasn't wasn't running to a train and taking an hour trip both in the morning and the evening and spending mm. more time with my dog and my husband. Um, so, I mean, but it's interesting that I was going through that up and down with the COVID and, you know, sometimes going, well, this is awesome. I don't have to go to, you know, jump on that train. On the other hand, oh my gosh, I can't see anyone. So, you know, yeah. it's that kind of turmoil back and forth. Um, and I can see how this will not just help people in their business, but help them in their personal lives when they begin to realize yeah. how much of your life is on autopilot. Yeah, you know, Roy, Roy made this point a bit earlier, and that is that if you rely on external things to determine how you feel about things, then you're going to be in for a rough ride. It's like a little rowboat in 40 foot seas. You're going to be up and down like crazy. Uh, but, uh, but if you can realize, and this is sort of the big aha moment when you begin to realize, yeah, there are things that happen that I don't like things that happen that really are painful things that, you know, are outside of me. I had no control over, but there's also the other side of it is that I'm either going to play victim to that, you know, and, and blame it or blame the external circumstances for how I feel, or I'm going to, I'm going to get over that upset fairly quickly and say, okay, 
Now, what do I choose to do? How am I going to be? What am I going to do in response to this? And that's really what it's about. That's the strength of attitude and why it's so important in many areas of our life, but in selling in particular, Mm -hmm. uh, it's because it it is such a great application to how you can really master your mind and, and experience fewer ups and downs. You know, instead of being like a thermometer that sort of registers the temperature hot or cold, you're more like a thermostat where you still have ups and downs, but you set it into a range and then you manage that and control that. Mm. Now that involves a skill and Mm. the skill of how to do that um, is what's in uh, our book, Decision Intelligent Selling. It's in that little book, One Thing That Changes Everything. It's in the new book that's going to come out in the spring called Sell Well, Do Good. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is a skill to be learned. And it's the skill of how do we regain what we had naturally when we were three, four, or five years old before the brain developed this frontal lobe part that started screwing us up. And what we had was the natural ability to simply be in the present moment and know what we deeply, deeply wanted. Mm. Nobody nobody does that like a three or four-year-old or five-year-old. Mm -hmm. And you can actually learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. The skill of getting into the present moment, there's numerous ways to do it. But we have found one in some of the more kind of esoteric literature that we call split attention. And if people want to go to our website, which is www.wrpartnership, Witten and Roy Partnership, so wrpartnership.com, There's a video there in the book section of Scott teaching people how to do split attention. And the wonderful thing about it is that we find so helpful is that you can do it while you're engaged in your life. You don't have to Mm -hmm. say, listen, excuse me, I need about 30 minutes to go (laughs) meditate for a while so I can stand to be in your company. You know, (laughs) it's it's like you can just keep doing what you're doing, being with who you're being with while you split your attention. And it's a skill that brings you right into the present moment. I'm doing it right now as I talk to you. Uh And once you're there, then the second part of the skill is knowing how to quickly dig down and go, what do I really want right now? Really? Mm. And why is it important to me? And when you do that, when you're in the present moment, all of a sudden you find that your attitude rises. Mm -hmm. It's the way we're built. Present moment awareness plus a deep desire Uh raises your attitude and brings forward a natural brilliance that allows you to succeed well in whatever it is you're doing. So you can see why I, with Roy's description, is it's all self-controlled, it's fast. When I learned this, Mm -hmm. I taught my salespeople how to do this. You know, it was like, you know, I mean, it, 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 uh, it absolutely had such a transformative effect on so many things on, you know, their, their, you know, their attitude, their performance, their willingness to stick with it and not quit, you know, you know, all of that, all to the good, you say. And, uh, and Roy is being a bit modest. I mean, he's saying we, but actually this was the work of his PhD was about split attention. So this isn't something that's sort of a, ooh, this sounds like a trendy little thing. This is well-researched and, yeah. you know, and it's, and it's an, an, an important thing to learn and, and know about. And it's very easy and very fast to learn. Well, I love that. You, you're offering awesome information that people can go out there today and, and learn and uh, apply immediately. And I love, see, what I gathered today, which I didn't know about, I've heard people mention attitude and you need to pay attention to what you're thinking and fix your attitude. But the one thing that didn't occur to me is what do you want? In the present moment, I've, mm. I've not thought that the kids, when they're begging for that ice cream, that's all they want in the world is that ice cream right now, right here. Yeah. And yeah. I, I heard someone say that, you know, sometimes I'll ask an adult, what do they want? Well, I don't know. And how, what, how have we lost that knowing what we want? I, it, it, have mm. we just buried it? Mm. Well, you lose it because this part of your brain starts taking over and telling you what to think, what to want, and what you better not ever try for. Mm-hmm. And it literally puts us to sleep. Wow. This is it's, it's this auto- path of autopilot, like, like an autopilot. So it's a good example of this is when you learn how to 
drive a, a stick shift versus a versus an automatic. Mm-hmm. You know, at first it's very difficult. You're very self conscious and all that. But in a few weeks, you know, or a few days, you get it all fine, and now you can, you know, do it and not even realize that you, you know, the difficulty you had before, and you do it so simply. Or you know, using a smartphone, how conscious we were about, oh gee, how do you do that now? You know, we can do that. Drive, you shouldn't do that. Drive, cook, you know, have carry on a conversation, et cetera. That's what autopilot does. And it does help us as human beings to perform at high levels, but it's not always that good when it comes to people to people relationships and performance. (laughs) So you need to, you need to learn how to, how to manage it to get, to restore that sense or to wake yourself up to the present moment and see exactly what's needed in this moment. And in selling, that's so important. Like, say, you know, for example, if I'm in a sales conversation, and I'm sure you can relate to this, Christine, mm-hmm. and, and, and a customer raises an objection, yeah. what I do in that moment is, or what most salespeople do in that moment is they get really scared or they get angry or they get resentful or whatever it might be yeah. uh, because and they think they're going to lose the sale. Yeah. 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 And then in acting in that way, how in the world can I possibly think clearly mm-hmm. and perform well as a salesperson? So the thing we teach them, and this is the magic of, I think, what decision intelligence does, Mm -hmm. is it takes really great selling skills and brings attitudinal mastery and performance and brings those together, you see. And so while I'm selling, I'm using my attitudinal mastery to receive the objection. I split my attention right in the moment. I play back what I'm hearing in the objection. So what you're saying, Christina, is da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da, you have to you know, da 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 da, and then you'll go, yeah. I said, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And so, more of the objection comes out. I understand it and say, well, now that you've mentioned this, what are your ideas about how you might be able to solve that? That might be my response, yeah. or my response might be, well, you know, you remind me of another customer mm-hmm. that I, I I dealt with, and they had a very similar situation. In and, and then I tell a story, or it could be that I say, you know, one thing I forgot to show you. You know, now that you've raised it, thank you very much. I realized I forgot to show you about this particular feature that really, you know, is geared to handle the concern you have, you see. But I can't do that if I'm upset, pissed off, angry, resentful, fearful, whatever it might be. I need to be able to think clearly, just like, uh, again, the sports example, the guy who's about to kick a field goal that's 47 yards to win the game in the last three seconds to win the Super Bowl, you better be thinking pretty clearly then. If you're thinking, boy, if I miss this, I'm going to be murdered tonight by my, you know, by my team. And then, and then again, <laughs> murdered by my fans, you know. So how, you know, so how am I going to bring my best forward? How do I get clear in that present moment mm-hmm. to bring my best forward, not to be influenced by any of that other thinking, you say? Yeah. That's what decision intelligence helps to deliver. And not only that, the customer truly feels that you're in their core. It's about them, and they yeah. feel heard. Is what I'm getting. Totally, totally. Well, totally. In so fact, the like uh, to go to decision intelligence yeah, selling. Yeah. Tell them again where to get your awesome book, Decision Intelligence Selling. Where do they get it? Yeah. Well, this uh, I don't know if, if people are in video. They can see this is uh, decision intelligence selling. They can get it on Amazon, uh, and uh, they can buy it through a Kindle version. It can be on the um, on the uh, iPad or on a on a computer, any sort of device, or they can get a, a softbound book or a hardbound version, mm-hmm. and uh, they can get that very easily. Also, Apple Books carries it as well, and uh, it's it's a uh, it's available internationally. So yes, and give them the website again where they can take that awesome assessment and get really focused on how to split attention and learn that wonderful skill. Right, that's WR Partnership wrpartnership.com. And, um, and it's, it's actually not a, it's not an assessment. It's actually, you watch a video just like we're talking right now Mm -hmm. and you watch the video and you do it along with me as I'm leading you through the experience, which takes about four and a half minutes. Great. This has been fabulous, uh, very valuable information. I know it's going to change a lot of people's lives listening in here. Any business owners struggling, this will be the best thing to help them get past that and grow their business. So I have to thank you both for coming here, Scott and Roy, for sharing your great wisdom today. Thank you so much. Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential.